Hey, Katie Kimball here from Kids Cook Real Food with this episode of the Healthy Parenting Connector, connecting parents who want to raise healthy kids with the experts who have the information you need. And today I am beyond privileged and honored to have Jessica Leahy, the author of a book that I'm just smitten about, The Gift of Failure, here with us. Thanks so much for being here, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you originally for posting about me on Facebook, because I think that's how I think my assistant saw it and then sent it to me and she said, oh, you should thank this person. So thank you so much. Oh, that's so fun. I I read um, your book and I thought, okay, I have got to share this with my audience. I hope I get to interview her like someday. It was just kind of this like, I'll have to get around to that. And then, yeah, I kind of used the strategy from the book, posted it on Facebook and (laughs) now we're here. So this is great. Well, and I managed to completely, I saw a message from you and then I managed to lose it. So, you know, this is how technology goes these days. It's, um, it works. It's really an amazing thing that, you know, if I love a book by an author, I can like reach out and say, I loved your book. And I get like, I'll occasionally get like tweets back saying, thank you. I'm so glad you love my book. And it's amazing what, that we have such incredible access to the people that, you know, whose work we read now. Yeah, for sure. The connectedness of the internet is amazing. And also how many times it offers us an opportunity to fail, like all (laughs) the time, every day. (laughs) Um, Absolutely. Let me introduce you real quick to my audience in case they haven't read your book, but audience, you have to go get it from the library, get it from the store. As soon (laughs) as we're finished here, order it from Amazon, wherever you get your books. Um, But Jessica Leahy here with us today is a middle school teacher who lasted among the pre-adolescents for over two decades and has not only lived to tell the tale, but has changed the ending for many more families than she's even encountered in the classroom because she's been teaching countless parents how to get out of the over-parenting trap with her New York Times best-selling book, which actually, technically, I listened to it at 1.5 speed, so you sound a little different, Jessica, and like normal speed. (laughs) (laughs) The book is called The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. There it is. It's been featured on the Today Show, Fox and Friends, and more. Jessica's also the mom of two test subjects, I mean, children, who happen to be the boy kind, and she's spoken all over the country about failure written for many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and PBS Parents. And today, I get to talk to her here at Kids Cook Real Food and the Healthy Parenting Connectors. So thanks again for being here. Of course. It's always, I, I love, you know, teaching is something that I do in the classroom still. I'm still in the classroom now. I teach high school kids. Um, but, you know, when I get to go out and talk to parents, it's like adjusting my, my mindset for a whole new audience. And it's, it's so much fun. I love my job. I love my job. That's awesome. That's awesome. A lot of people in our audience are actually homeschool families. So they're both the teachers and the parents. So I I feel like they are like even more invested in this kind of philosophy. Um, And we're we're all about the positive here. But for just one question, Mm -hmm. let's start with the problem, Jessica. What is wrong with our kids in America? And why did you see a need to teach parents about the value of failure? Well, so, you know, you talk about it being a negative, but where it really started was when I was teaching middle school, one thing people need to know about middle school is it is it is amazing. I love, love, love middle school. So it, it, it all comes from this place of every single moment, you know, we're trying to maximize education as much as possible. How much can we fit into the day? How much can, you know, we have to teach so much in the curriculum. How are we going to get it all done? And then there are all these moments where the teaching that I actually like the most, which is the, you know, walking around every day and seeing the kids in the morning and talking to them about, you know, oh, sweetie, you know, you've forgot your homework again for like five days in a row. So how are we going to, how can I support you in coming up with a system so that you can remember it tomorrow? And that kind of informal teaching, um, especially I was working in a really small school. And when I say small, I mean, like um, we were, I was in a double wide trailer. So I, we, we were on top of each other all the time. But from my perspective, it was great because I really got to see not just how they were in the classroom, but how they were, you know, just all the time talking with their friends and getting ready for class and all that. So all these incredible moments that I would pick really carefully because you can't you know, kids aren't teachable every single moment. You got to pick some really good moments to talk to them, especially about things like, you know, their organization and stuff. Um, I would pick these really carefully, these moments, and then, you know, a parent would run in with the homework and drop it off, or someone, a parent would run in with the homework assignment, or I would notice that the homework assignment was in someone else's handwriting, or, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. 
And to me, that was hard because it was all of these learning opportunities lost. So I, and the, the thing about gift of failure is, yes, it came from me being frustrated with the parents, but at the same time, right when I was sort of at peak angry, I, um, and I, I also, I realized I was on a very high horse. I was viewing myself as like the noble teacher and you parents are screwing it up for me. But I realized I was doing the same thing to my own kids. Cause I had, I tell this story in the book, but I had a nine year old who didn't know how to tie his shoes. And that was my fault. I did that to him. And every time I, looked at him and you know it was time to get it going and i tied his shoes for him what i was really saying to him was you know i don't think you're capable enough competent enough to handle this so from my perspective it was really getting kind of urgent because i was also hearing from my students that they weren't um that learning had become beside the point for them and i was hearing from other teachers because because at that point i was writing about education uh, multiple places i was hearing from a lot of teachers that um increasingly kids were less teachable and so um, I, I sort of put together all the research on motivation and on how we learn and how we parent. And it turns out the cliff notes on this whole thing is the more directed kids are, the more we tell them how to do it, where to do it, in what order to do it, um, the less able they are to learn in the classroom. Because as a teacher, some of my most effective teaching tools, the ones that we know for a fact work best for kids are less effective in kids who can't be frustrated. And kids who are highly directed have a lot of trouble getting frustrated. They tend to fall apart. And those teaching tools just don't work very well for kids who can't be frustrated. So it all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this is not just about being frustrated with parents for overparenting. This is their kids can't learn as well. And um, it was urgent for me as a parent and clearly urgent for me as a teacher as well. So the book is, I try to be as, I really do try to be positive in the book. I hope it, I hope there isn't a lot of negativity there because I have made every mistake in the book, uh, both as a teacher and a parent, so. No, no, the book's totally positive, but you know, we know that any change or any passion generally comes from a deficit, right? And you saw right. that deficit in the kids. Now you just use the word frustration. How do you see mm -hmm. frustration and failure intertwining here in this whole process so what i was seeing was that a lot of kids were so afraid to fail that they felt that the stakes were so high either because they wanted to make their parents proud they wanted to make their teachers happy but increasingly there was this really high anxiety perfectionist thing going on where um and if you've ever read the work of carol dweck um her work on mindset you know one of the things we know thank goodness for carol dweck is that kids who are really tuned into this idea that either they're smart or they're not are a lot less likely to take challenge problems, a lot less likely to raise their hand in class and admit when they don't know something, a lot less likely to take on a challenge that that they might get wrong because they don't want to be shown up as not as smart as we thought they were. And so I need kids to take the challenge problems. I need kids to raise their hand. I need kids to tell me when they don't understand something. Um, and so that fear of making mistakes was hindering kids' ability to try stuff. And in, in from a parenting perspective, and I've seen this in my kids too, you know, you take your kid to their first gymnastics practice, their very first gymnastics class, and everyone's so excited. And then the kid can't do a cartwheel perfectly the first time, and she falls apart. And she's like, I'm never going to gymnastics ever again. I can't do it. That right there is a huge block to learning. And it's that fear of failure, that fear of not being perfect, that fear of not fulfilling our expectations or whatever expectations that is getting in the way of their being able to learn. And so, you know, frustration is is a natural response to, you know, to not being able to do something or not feeling like you're good enough or whatever to, but the problem is, is that the more we just avoid, um, that feeling the less we're going to learn because we're never putting ourselves out there in a way that gives us the opportunity to sort of push through um, it turns out one of the most effective teaching tools i have as a teacher is this thing called desirable difficulties and it requires kids to push through their frustration and benefit from 
screwing it up and trying it a different way or um, you know having that experience of pushing through figuring out what works and what doesn't work and leaving that stuff behind and taking you know the stuff that does work with you so it's a really valuable teaching tool and if they can't ever get there or push through it then we we're kind of sunk mm -hmm. yeah. so in a nutshell what do you encourage parents to do when it comes to I mean I heard that word expectations yeah. used a lot mm -hmm. The problem is, is that kids, um, we say a lot that we, what we care about is the learning, um, but over and over and over again, when I talk to kids about what they perceive their parents care most about, they believe their parents care more about their academic achievement than the learning. And so we may say that what we care about is the learning, but they're, that's not what they're hearing from us. And so one of the things that it's really important for us to do is to use words like yet. Um, schools across the country increasingly will have like yet up on a billboard in the classroom or the teachers will wear a little pin that says yet because yet is this incredible word of about progress. Of course you can't do this yet. You just learned it. Or of course you can't do this yet. This is your first time trying out how to do it. Or, you know, you're 10 or, you know, all of these reasons that we can't do something yet are so important. Focusing more on the process than the end product is not only gets them to believe us when we say that what we care about is the learning more than you know the end number that comes out of that assignment the grade um, it also you know helps them understand that we really do care more about the learning than we do about the end result because that focusing on the process um, shows them as opposed to just telling them that what we care about is the learning and you know one of the other big um, things I've discovered I, I speak to hundreds of thousands of kids a year and every time I do I ask them I ask them whether they get paid for grades and I ask them about whether they get stuff for grades. But then in, in the last question I ask them is I ask them, I have everyone close their eyes, including the teachers and the kids. And I say, raise your hand if you really and truly believe that your parents love you more when you get high grades and less when you get low grades. And in middle schools, about 80% of the kids raise their hands. And in high school, about 90% of the kids raise their hand. Oh, that breaks my heart. I know. So when we tell them, you know, these yet words or focus on the process, or if they bring home a low grade and we say, oh, that's interesting. What did you do to get that grade? What are you going to do next time? Um, what are you going to leave behind? What are you going to take forward with you? Did you get enough sleep? Did you, you know there are all these things that we can talk to them about that has to do with process and not you know an F is really bad. Well, and I joke actually when I'm talking to parents that, you know, because F uh, B minus has become the new F that, you know, kids will come home with a B minus and we, you know, we're kind of silent. And that silence when we sort of are shocked into not responding or are disappointed into not responding, that's called um, withdrawal of love based on performance. And that's really emotionally damaging to kids. And so the more we can focus on the process and less on the product, the better it's going to be for them in terms of believing us when we tell them that what we really care about is the learning. Okay, good advice. We got to walk the talk. Well, and it's hard. And, you know, when, when people ask me sort of what is the number one thing you do on a daily basis to, you know, to follow your own advice, and I say the very first the thing I have to do all day long is say what are my long-term goals for my kids not what would make me feel better right in this moment not what would make life easier for him right in this moment like if of course it would make it easier if I just said forget it I'll load the dishwasher you go do something else or I'll tie your shoes for you um, until you're 21 that would make me feel better because I wouldn't ever have to see him frustrated I wouldn't have to ever have to see him sad but that that can't be my long-term goal for my kids my long-term goals have to be that I want my kid to be able to do it himself next time so that's something that even with 20 year old and 15 year old kid, which is how old my kids are now, um, that's something I have to, even with the 20 year old, um, he went on a, he flew somewhere today with his girlfriend and there were all these things I wanted to do for him. And I still couldn't resist opening the window as he was leaving and yelling, you have your passport, right? But you know, at, in the end, what I want for him is that for him to be able to go on a trip by himself, make lists, know what to pack, figure out how to remember his passport himself, 
um, I don't want to have to be chasing him and yelling out the window till he's 50. You know, that's not, that's not my goal for him. So yeah, okay. long term over short term. Yes. And, and I do think that, I mean, if you ask any parent what they want long term, they, they'd be right in that boat with you. They would totally yeah. agree with you. But what do you think makes it so hard for most parents to implement on a day to day basis? Is it the same thing that you struggle I, with that others struggle with or what? I think the problem is, is that we are so emotionally tied up in these emergencies. Like, you know that um, when the caller ID says it's the school or when uh, you get a phone call from the school saying, you know, here's the problem and you, your stomach gets just all tied up in knots and the thing you want to do is just fix it. And if you can just fix it like okay I'm gonna sit there with my kid while they do their homework every single night and that's gonna solve the problem but that's not gonna solve the problem what that's going to do is in the short term it's gonna make you feel like you're solving the problem it's going to make you feel better but in the long term you're not teaching your kid anything about how they are going to strategize over the long term and so I was talking to a mom recently who um, has a lot of trouble, surprise, surprise, getting her kids out of the house in the morning. It's all very complicated. And she feels like every single day that she's having to basically go behind her kids and pick up all the things they're forgetting. And I said, look, our job is not to be the reason that they don't forget everything every day. Our job is to stop at the door and say, you know, when I'm going off to work in the morning, I'm liable to forget all kinds of things because we're rushing and blah, blah, blah. And so I do this thing where I stop and I take a breath and I go through this checklist in my head. What do I need? Okay, I need my wallet. I need my briefcase. I need my phone, whatever. So why don't we all stop right now and take a deep breath and do that? Or, sweetie, it feels like, you know, in the morning you seem to forget your backpack every day. So what are some ideas that you could come up with for how you could remember your backpack in the morning? Maybe, you know, and then, and, and not even handing them your, your system for how to do it. And what's amazing is this mom said that she did that. They took some time the night before and they said, look, mornings stink around here. Everyone's mad all the time. So how can I help you in the morning? You picture for me what your perfect morning looks like. Let's talk about what your perfect morning would look like. And then let's talk about some ways that we could make that happen. And her daughter, who was, I think, seven, all on her own came up with, well, what if we packed my backpack the night before and put it right next to the door? Or um, another mom told me that her daughter put a little checklist next to the door. Um, another, for the younger kid then, they put little pictures of all the things he needed to forget or needed to forget <laughs> I remember right next to the door so having those moments where you could say okay what would your perfect morning look like and how do you think you can make that happen I'll help you I'll, you know I'm happy to help you draw pictures of things and whatever but you need to come up with the way that that's gonna happen and and uh, you know when I finally sort of had that ability to step back and say you know I'm here for you if you need me but the systems that are going to work for you are the ones you come up with by yourself. So how can I support you in coming up with your own ways to make that happen? And um, that's been, that was a huge breakthrough in with both of my kids, actually, in terms of doing homework, in terms of getting out of the house, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. I mean, all these executive function skills that we need to grow up and be mature, responsible adults, we, we have to take that time to let our kids. We weren't born just knowing how to do that. And there's, you know, we had to try, like for me, I still use writing in a journal with a, with a to-do list because, and checklists, because that's the system that's worked best for me. But I've tried 26 different systems. You know, when Palm Pilots first came out, I tried that, I, but I'm back to paper because that's what works best for me. But that was trial and error. I tried like 26 different things. And to expect that my system is going to work for my kids is crazy because that's buy-in is what really gets systems to work best for kids. Sure, so if they sure. come up with it themselves, that's how you get your buy-in. Awesome. And it's definitely, I mean, it's an investment for parents to remember to sit down and have that conversation the night before. But it's so worth it because that's yeah. many, many minutes and hours that you're not chasing around after your kids feeling frustrated. Well, it's um, also that moment when you can't have those sort of conversations when everyone's already upset and heated and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of these conversations are best had, you know, in the afternoon after a snack and everybody's happy and say, you know what, I've noticed blah. And then, you know, 
trying to have that conversation in a moment of calm and quiet is much more effective than trying to have it at a time of craziness. It just doesn't work then. Yep. I've even added things like that to my list or <laughs> yeah. reminders in my yeah. phone so that it's not the crazy moment. Well, last time I went to the airport with my, I was traveling with, I travel a lot for work and I was traveling with my younger son and I, I scheduled in some extra time so that when we got to the airport, I made him in charge of, I said, we got, and he travels with me all the time, but he'd been on autopilot. He hadn't really, it's sort of like when kids are first learn how to drive they don't actually know how to get anywhere because they were never paying attention when we drove it's the same thing with like going to the airport we stepped inside the door and i said so what do we do first and he's like i don't i don't know why are you asking me and i'm like because you're running this ship i i scheduled in an extra half an hour so what do we do and he had to learn how to use the kiosk and he had to learn how to check baggage and he had to learn, you know, hold his own stuff when he went through security and ha be in charge of his own ID and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it was a massive and it was an extra 30 minutes, honestly, an extra 30 minutes that made a huge difference. Now I now I know if he has to do a flight, he knows what to do. And that's no longer you know, it's it. I'm no longer at the place where I'm like, oh, I wish I'd done that because now he's got to fly somewhere and he has no idea how to do it. So yeah, sure. it takes some pre-planning. Yeah, I mean that's a great example of what it looks like and feels like and the skills you build when yeah. parents, you know, live your philosophy and do what you recommend. Right. What about the flip side? I mean, what are what are we risking here? What does it look yeah. like when people don't allow their kids to be frustrated and to fail? So increasingly what we know for a fact is happening is that um there are more and more kids taking um a sort of mental health year of uh, first year of college it's taking longer for kids to graduate from college um a friend of mine who wrote a book i love that came out just about the same time mine came out called um how to raise an adult julie lithcott hames julie was um a, the dean freshman dean at stanford and she the reason she wrote her book is that she had kids in her office, freshmen at Stanford, one of, you know, the best and the brightest. And she said these kids didn't know how to do basic problem solving. They knew how, you know, they'd gotten great scores on their math and their and they could go and, you know, win science fairs, but they couldn't solve, you know, I'm having this roommate problem. How do I solve that? Or how do I write an email to my professor asking for an extension on this thing? And Julie referred to them as um, existentially impotent. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who they were, what they wanted, how to achieve these goals. And increasingly, I hear from a lot of college professors that they're, the, the kids just don't even know how to approach a problem. Um, I was at a college speaking recently and a mom came up to me and showed me the app she keeps for her daughters to track her daughter. Her daughter has a disease. Um, I'll, I guess it's not specific. It's not non-specific. So her daughter had diabetes and her mom had the app tracking her blood sugar and the daughter doesn't do it. The mom does it. And the daughter's in college. And so I said, well, do you have a plan for weaning you as a twosome off of this situation and into a situation where she's in charge of her own disease and the mother had to say the mother had to admit that no they don't really have a plan the mother's too scared mm -hmm. to let the daughter and the daughter's 20 19 or 20 and at a certain point I i'm sorry but the daughter's going to have to learn how to manage her own diabetes and maybe 20 is a little late to start you know start that process so you know that's where we can end up you know we can end up with kids who really just don't know how to do basic problem solving and and i don't know i want i want my kid to be unafraid to step out in the world and ask people to help him or you know to try something without fear that he's going to look stupid or that he won't get it right the first time. And um, I don't know if you can see it, but behind me, there's a poster for a show called The Stinky and Dirty Show. It's a show on Amazon Kids and the, the curriculum is based on the gift of failure. And it's about these two machines that have to do some problem solving in their community. And it's all about feeling like you have the support of the people around you to screw things up and to try again and to feel like you're not loved less because you can't get it right the first time. You're not a failure if you can't get it right the first time. You're just a human being that's learning how to navigate through the world. And, sure. you know, and actually, I, it's funny I say that, but actually girls and boys are slightly different. Girls, um, girls actually have a, a tendency 
to view themselves as failures as opposed to that thing that they're trying to get right as a failure. Boys have a little bit easier time saying, oh, that thing I did over there, that was a failure. I'm cool. But that thing over there, that was a failure. Girls um, have a little, are more likely to say that I, I screwed this thing up. I am a failure. And then they're less likely to view the evidence of their own successes and say, oh, I, wow, I'm successful. They're more likely to say, I had help or I was lucky or blah, blah, blah. So especially with girls, it's really important for us to show them, no, you, I, I, I feel like you're competent enough to handle this. So, you know, go out and see that in yourself. And, and it's, it's a little trickier for them, actually. Well, I can totally see that. And I'm so glad that you're bringing this idea down to little kids, I assume, based on, that's like a cartoon yeah. poster in the background. Yeah. Uh, because I, I too have interviewed a lot of teachers recently and they say that kids are, are nearly helpless, like yeah. sitting on the floor yelling, I can't find my shoe. Yeah. And they say, did you look? Like they didn't even look at all. Yeah. They just yell, I can't find my shoe and expect yeah. the universe to drop their shoe on their nose, I guess. But well, then they would cry and there'd be another problem. <laughs> I, well, I used to call that feigned helplessness. I wrote an article for the, at the New York, I had a column at the New York Times called the Parent Teacher Conference. And I wrote an article there about what I thought was called feigned helplessness um, or what I perceived as feigned yeah. helplessness, but it's, it's not, it's called learned helplessness. And we, we teach that to them. And what's really interesting, if you look at the research on learned helplessness, um, the most recent sort of roundup of all of that research shows that the that's our natural response to sort of want to curl up in a ball and say, I can't do it. That's sort of the, you know, as human beings, our response to long-term pain or suffering or frustration is to want to give up and to sort of curl up and go helpless. But it turns out that the way to diffuse that is with giving control back. Mm -hmm. when we give control back, it gives people a sense um, of feeling like they actually have some control over the situation. And the way I the way I refer to it sometimes is, you know how when you have toddlers and it's cold outside, you don't say, do you want to wear a hat? You say, would you like to wear the red hat, the blue hat? Giving kids at least a tiny bit of control over how something goes down, it's called giving them some autonomy, gives uh, pretty much assu uh, assures you that you're going to get some buy-in because when the kid is having some control over the decision or how things work, then they're more likely to say, oh yeah, okay, I want to wear the blue hat. And then they're more likely to feel like that was their choice. Mm -hmm. And then they don't feel helpless and they don't feel hopeless. And they don't feel like that they're just being steered through their lives. They're feeling like, you know, I have little control. So really think of that little toddler with the hat. And then every time, you know, when they get to a teenager, start giving them choice about how they do their homework, where they do their homework. The way you did your homework when you were in high school maybe isn't the same way that they or place or time that they will do their homework. And having these conversations about like, okay, what would your perfect homework day look like? Where would you do it? How would you do it? What time before you play for a while or after you play for a while? And, you know, giving kids the ability to have some choice over those things can really make a huge difference because we don't tend to ask them a lot how they would like to control things. Mm. And it's really quite a magical thing when it works. I like that. You, you've used that phrase a few times. What would your perfect blank look like? Is that kind of a, a phrase that you teach parents to use with their kids? Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it, think about it. Um, uh, if you're going, if your kid's going to go off to college and you say, okay, well, what's, what does your perfect freshman year look like? And then they say, oh, I'll have a mentor. I'll have classes. I like, I, you know, I'll be in a dorm. I like, and then you say to them, okay, how are you going to make that happen? Mm -hmm. These things aren't just going to fall in your lap. So let's do some strategizing. You say you want to be a part of a, I don't know, a religious community at your school. Well, there are places for that. Why don't you look online and see where those places are? You say you want to find a mentor. Well, why don't you go, you know, here, give them the opportunity to, to sort of do some exploring because part of that is about making goals. And increasingly what's not happening in kids is this thing called, they're not getting a lot of chance to practice what's called self-directed executive function, which is setting a goal and then having to plan all the things that you have to do to get to that goal. Because the perfect freshman year of college doesn't just happen. You have to have 
a strategy for how you're going to find that mentor or how you're going to figure out who to live with and where and what dorm and all that sort of stuff and being proactive and having those sort of conversations so that you can help them realize that they're going to have to do some work on their end to make that perfect vision happen. Um, you know, you can talk about it having to do with the first year of high school or, you know, we're going back to school in a couple months. You know, what is the, what do you think a great year would look like? How, you know, what might that look? Do you have any goals for that? And that's actually why in Gift of Failure, the chapter on grades, I'm a little sneaky because the chapter on grades is actually a chapter about goal setting um, instead of about grades. Mainly because that's what I did as an advisor and it worked so well. And I can't believe I never thought to do it with my own kids. So I think sometimes we do, we think with two brains, right? We think with our professional brain and then our mom brain is just like so much more reactive instead of intentional. I think it would be such a good thought exercise for any parent to think what they want for their kids and, and are they getting one step closer every year, or every six months yeah. to kind of that end goal. I mean, that's what we encourage people to think about when we talk mm -hmm. about cooking, like you, you're not going to cut their meat forever. Right. You're not going to cook for them forever. So how, you know, what, yeah, what steps are you taking? I feel like everyone right now, like put a reminder in your phone for every, your, each one of your kids' birthdays or the day after, what do we want for our kids, you know, when they grow up and have we taken steps in the last year? What are we doing this well, the year? Well, nice thing about goals is, number one, the nice thing about goals is that if it's your personal goal and you don't achieve it, who cares? It was your goal. You know, so what, one of the things that I talk about in the book that was also just a big change in our family is that we would set, um, we would sit down as a family and each person had to come up with three goals for, you know, school starting. What are your goals for this fall or um, a new year starting? What are your, you know, what kind of goals do you have for the next couple months? And, um, and then, one of those things always has to be a little bit scary, a little bit um, hard, a little bit outside your comfort zone. And for the nice thing about that is like, I can't make those goals for my kids and I have to make them for myself too. So when my kid, for example, if I have been um, submitting work to a particular magazine I want to write for and I keep getting rejected, but I keep talking to them about what I'm doing differently so that next time, maybe I'll get in for, and this is a, a real, a, a real example so that my kids can see, Oh, she did this thing. Didn't just happen the first time she tried to make it happen. It was a process and she had to learn from it. So, you know, we tend to have this, this, um, this thing where we don't want to tell our kids about what we're screwing up because we want to be perfect for them or something, but um, they're on to us. They know we're not perfect. And so talking to them about our own struggles is like, the best possible education we can give our kids. And, and yet we tend to deny that um, that education from them. So talking about our own goals in front of kids is great too, because then they can see us, you know, really struggle when we mess something up. And that's important. Yeah, that is good. And it's uncomfortable for parents. Wow. I know I always tease my kids. I go, oh, I made a mistake. First one since 1987. And like, <laughs> but they are, they are on to me, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, totally. I just now that you said that, I remember we set some goals. We were going to do monthly goals at the beginning of the year. And uh, apparently I forgot to follow through on finishing that goal. So new goal for Katie. <laughs> Get back to that after, yeah. after the next break, you know, each, each phase. But I, I do think, I mean, that's where technology can help us. We can put little reminders in our own, you know, online calendars, like Alar I know. The goals Alarm or whatever. Alarms on a calendar are like the best tool ever. They are so amazing because you can, for kids and for my students, I have them set goal, set alarms for like the week before they're going to have to start thinking about this thing. Like if they, if I have a deadline, you know, next week, I'll usually set a deadline alert for this week saying, have you thought about that article you're going to have to hand in next week? And so my kids now do the same thing, which is, you know, Ooh, that rough draft is going to be due next week. Have I thought about it yet? That kind of thing that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to get your mindset. I know my, yeah. my 13 year old has asked for a cell phone. His application yeah. was denied by the parental board. And, you know, we have this really long term plan of like how he's going to build responsibility. And we do, we have monthly kind of check-ins in the calendar. Like what yeah. have you done as far as calendar skills in the last yeah. month? So, so far not much movement, but I'm okay with it being really long term and, you know, eventually he'll figure that out. <laughs> So do you have any suggestions for parents about like various ages at which they can pass off these different responsibilities? Because I know, I mean, you worked in middle school and high mm -hmm. school. So I feel like a lot of your examples are for really old kids. Mm -hmm. But what about our 
twos and our fives and, you know, yeah. our little kids. I know when I read your book, I was like, great, I should just let everybody fail all the time and let everybody do everything on their own. And, you know, pretty quickly I realized, oh, like I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. Like I can't actually just say like, don't forget your lunch and remember your homework once a week. Uh, no, so there's a, a process of letting go. Do you have any practical yeah. tips for that? Well, the really practical day-to-day -day thing is picture where your kid's ability level is um, and, and take an honest assessment, not like we tend to us underestimate our kids a lot. And if you want a really good example of that, um, ask your kid to do something that they have never, ever done before and don't give them a lot of directions and just see how um, inventive they can be with finding solutions. It's really quite amazing. Um, parents send me videos all the time of stuff that they've asked their kid to do. A mom, and recently it was really cute. Someone sent me a video of, um, a kid unloading the dishwasher um, and she had made little stacks of things so she could put stuff in drawers. Another parent sent me um, a video of uh, um, getting the clothes out of the washing machine and putting them in the dryer and the kid would get in the washing machine and he had told his little sister to hold on to his feet because in case he fell in she would have to pull him back out and it was just and you know there was an adult there watching and it was it was really really sweet but I'm constantly thinking, okay, where's my understanding or my belief about my kid's ability level? And then I just put my little toe right over it, just a little tiny bit past it. So that's always my goal. If I think this is what they can do, I try to put just my toe over the line. And the nice thing about that is, then you're talking about all kinds of kids, kids who aren't neurotypical, kids who are neurotypical, kids who are geniuses, kids who, you know, are behind it. All of these kids, if you know, if you can take an honest assessment of where your kid is and then expect just a tiny bit more. And there's all kinds of research that this works in education. If you take a whole bunch of kids who are all perfectly average and then you divide them into a whole bunch of groups and you give teachers those same kids the, all those perfectly average kids but you tell the teacher that some of the kids are way above average the kids that the teachers expect to be way above average will perform better because our expectations of our kids often really define what they're able to do um, so I try to think about that with my own kids and yeah there's there's backsliding. I asked my kid, my 15 year old to help me with something day before yesterday. And he pretended like he had no idea what I was talking about. And I know he knows what I'm talking about. It was just a really bad day, but our, our expectations really mean something to our kids. And when we show them that we think they're competent, they're a lot more likely to believe that they're competent. Mm -hmm. So again, it's about being intentional, like yeah. think, taking a pause from the hecticness of daily life and thinking, you know, have I pushed my child in the area of maybe it's the kitchen or school right. or room cleaning responsibility, right? It's kind of all these little compartments of life. If they haven't made any changes in the last year, they're probably below where they could be. Well, and as you well know, I mean, the longer we go without teaching our kids about how to use knives properly, the more dangerous it becomes because the kids start to believe that they have skills that they don't have. So, you know, it's the same thing with all these skills that kids need to have. And, and when we're so scared of risk um, and we don't let them take on any risk and we don't teach them how to do it from a young age, these things become more and more dangerous because the older kids get, the more they want to embrace risk. And um, so if we can start when they're really young and have them really have the skills when they're young to be able to take on things like using knives or, you know, using the, the stove from a very young age, then they know what's safe and what's not safe. And they're going to grow into their threshold for risk because when they get to be teenagers, um, the threshold for risk goes way up um, and not in accordance with their ability to handle that risk, unfortunately. Right. And parental influence goes way down. So yeah. it's kind of this deadly exactly. combination. I exactly. feel like what you're saying is that for parents of young children, like we want to make the calculated risk for them right. and then let them get to the end rather than us holding their hand right. all the way to the end. So we got risk, right. embrace, frustration, embrace all the little failures right. and stumbles along the way. Well, and the nice thing about writing, the fun thing about writing this book is that it really is for K through 12 and beyond because, and, you know, I, I got to talk with a lot of kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade teachers about, um, you know, what kids can do at certain ages, not what parents believe kids can do at certain ages, but what their teachers know they can do at those, and kindergarten teachers in particular, they're like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. These kids can do so much more than we give them credit for. And um, I used... 
a whole bunch of sources that I really love, one in particular called um, Touch Points, I believe it's called, um, to really figure out what kids are capable of from a physical and an emotional perspective and helping them um, grow into what they're actually capable of as human beings in their, you know, their hand-eye coordination and their manual dexterity and helping them learn how to be a really productive part of the family. Because as it turns out, the more that when kids help with stuff around the house and the more kids help with cooking and the more kids help with cleaning up, the more they feel like they're part of the family and the more they feel like they're pu helping push the family forward and supporting, being supportive and supporting the family, the less likely they are to suffer um, emotional damage when something bad happens in the family. If there's a divorce, if there's a death, if there's an illness, kids who have feel like they have part of the burden of helping the family move forward, those kids are more resilient in those situations. So little things like a kid feeling like if it really came down to it, he or she could warm up her own dinner. Um, that Those kind of small things make kids feel like they can help the family when things get rough. And that's really important for kids. They need to feel useful. And when we take that away from them, we are not helping them out at all. Isn't that amazing? I mean, there's such a negative connotation with the word you just used, burden, to give yeah. our kids a burden. It's like, wait a minute, that can't be good parenting. But yeah. literally, they need to build their family muscles, right? Mm -hmm. They have to be carrying the burdens yeah. in case they have to. Yeah, exactly. Right? So they're ready. That's so good. We talk a lot, too, at Kids Cook Girl Food about building resiliency and how connections among the family and building confidence and genuine right. self-esteem way beyond participation ribbons and sticking their stuff to the fridge. So I'm like... Totally with you. And, and and I always have been. But even in spite of that, like reading your book, I think I read it about six months ago. And I've told so many people like this book has changed the oh. way I parent because it's been it's been like a mindset thing where before if my kids would make a mistake, I might get frustrated with them like, oh, my gosh, they're not perfect. Obviously, that's a fallacy in thinking, but or frustrated with myself. Like, why haven't I taught them this yet? And so now it's just like so much more chill. Like, oh, they get a chance to fail. What a lovely opportunity. And so when I remember when I'm in the right mindset, like it's really a much more peaceful parenting strategy, which is good, I think, for parents to hear like sharing the burden does take some off you as long as you know as long as you're doing it with kind of the right mindset but the hardest part is when it feels like the kids aren't learning and I wonder how other parents talk to you about that like how do you well, are there training wheels involved there's definitely backsliding periods too I was talking with my editor at the New York Times uh, I said was talking about the fact that you know my kid had just it was he was a disaster it was like he'd forgotten everything I'd ever taught him and she and we were walking through the woods and she said yeah, but think about where he was six months ago. And it was like, you know, she's absolutely right. Six months ago, he couldn't do all these things that he can do now, but we we tend to live so much in the emergency moment that we don't think about these long, the long-term progress. And that's, we have to start thinking long-term. It is, a, parenting is a long haul. It's not you know, we can't measure our progress in the every every single day. That's just not how parenting works. It's just not something that we're going to be able to do. And if we feel like we should be able to do that, we're going to drive ourselves crazy because some days are terrible. But the overall picture should be moving towards more competence, towards more autonomy for our kids because we are trying to raise kids who won't need us someday. And, you know, that's hard to hear and it's totally devastating to me on an emotional level but on another level i'm like woohoo i would love get to get to a point where you know my kid can go out into the world and report back and say hey check it out i handled this thing and realize that oh my gosh you know they actually are able to go out into the world and handle stuff and that that that's when we really get to feel the big the big victories Nice. Yeah. Best feeling ever. What yeah. advice do you have for parents who are in that moment? Like my gut is always to recommend the solution, but I feel like that's probably yeah. not the, the yeah. best thing. Like take room cleaning, for example. I keep hoping that they'll learn by failure because they've lost something they want or they just won't be able to tolerate it anymore, but it's not working so far. <laughs> I know long term, but like well, what are the questions or or comments that you give to kids. We can definitely talk situation. about room cleaning specifically, but that's kind of a tangent. But what I think, I, I think the big picture idea is that if you're moving towards a situation in which your kid is able to 
be proactive to anticipate when they need to do something. You know, there's that like, yes, I can get a kid to do something when I tell them to do it, but oh my gosh, getting them to notice that it needs to be done. Well, say that to them, say, you know, I'm a big fan of transparency with kids and help filling them in on what our goals are and why we're doing the things we're doing. I'm not, you know, having you do this thing because I like being mean to you. I'm having you do this thing because you're going to have to do this on your own when you get bigger. And I would be a bad mom if I didn't give you the opportunity to do that. Now, where it comes to room cleaning, I do have to call you on this because um, a lot of parents, parents ask me about this all the time. I just can't get my kid to keep his room clean. And I have to push back and say, why is it so important for you that your kid's room is clean? Because think about kids need to have autonomy, especially as they get older, and they need more of it as they get older. Think about the one place in the entire world where they have some control over their environment, and that's their room. And for me, um, it, you know, it was re it was really, really important for my kids, for me to let my kids have one place where they knew it was completely theirs and they had control over everything in it. Um, and that was their room. And so, you know, from a certain perspective, I totally get some people are worried that, you know, if you don't teach them about order or uh, what is what is the saying or, uh, organized world organized mind or whatever it is but i'll have you know i was an extraordinarily messy child and i am a persnickety neat adult so you know the idea that we need to you know have them be absolutely neat from the moment they are are born i don't know but the, the big the big message i want to get across is that I get email all the time from parents about how their kids have become more autonomous and how they have their, you know, they're able to handle, stop the dog is hitting the computer with his <laughs> Um how their kids have more autonomy and they're getting more stuff done and they don't have to be reminded and they're not having to nag and all that's great. I love those letters. But the letters that mean the most to me are the ones where parents say, you know what, I stopped nagging. I stopped um, being on top of my kid all the time and our relationship has improved. Mm -hmm. That right there for me, those are the ones that make me cry because when you can move away from a position of being that constant have you done this? Have you done that? Nagging, nagging, nagging. Why haven't you done this yet? Why aren't you doing it on my schedule? Have you thought about that homework assignment that you have due? When we can get rid of that, we have more room in our existence to just talk about stuff. Like, you know, you've seen kind of sad lately. And is there something going on that you want to talk about? That's the sort of relationship I want to have with my kid. I don't want to be you know, that sort of hovering, oh, and plus they stop listening to us. We become in the, you know, in the Peanuts commercial or Peanuts cartoons when the adults are like, wah, 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 wah. Totally. They do, they're like, okay, well, if she's going to nag, I'm just going to tune her out. And they stop hearing us. So, yep. yeah. Okay. So Katie, chill is the prescription there. <laughs> Katie, close <laughs> the door. Think about, you know, if it does, our room, our rule was if it doesn't spill out into the hallway, um, you know, keep it behind the door. That was our okay. rule. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is as they've evolved as people, uh, um, they go through periods of being neat and tidy and periods of not. My college kid now is actually a pretty neat kid, and I never made him clean his room, hardly ever when he was little. So, you know, sometimes I guess, I guess sometimes we have to pick our battles, pick the things that are really important to us. And frankly, it was more important to me, A, to have a good relationship, and B, to focus on other skills and things duties around the house that i thought were really going to be um positive and productive for them and giving them a place to express themselves and have them be their own people was really important to me and um and that meant letting letting them have some leeway in their rooms gotcha love that i will be able to do that to most of my kids one just got diagnosed with a dust allergy so he has oh, to a clean room now it's like oh man I should send you, I have a photograph that when I was on the Today Show once about um, raising creative children, I sent them a picture of the the walls in my kids, my younger kids' room, and we had painted them all blue, the color blue that's on a globe, the ocean. And then he had used Sharpie to draw, black Sharpie to draw a world, basically, all over his room. And some parents were just like, never in a million years can I even possibly let my child draw on the walls. And I even, uh, one of the most um, 
uh, popular posts I ever put on my blog was about the fact that you can write on the outside of the washer and dryer with dry erase markers if you have you know the enameled outside and you can put all the instructions all over the machine in dry erase markers and a parent wrote me and said I couldn't do that it would look too messy and I'm sorry but if you're worried about your washer and dryer looking too messy um, and you're not willing to you know give your kid the tools in order to be able to do those things themselves then I think your priorities are a little out of whack but that uh, writing on the outside of the washer and dryer it's a, a blog on my on my at jessicalahey.com called special care instructions was one of the most fun tasks I ever had and actually changed the changed my kids because I they could never ever say I, I don't know how to do that because all the instructions were written all over the machine like even little things like stop are your underwear balled up inside your pants take them back out and untangle them or stop are your socks balled up take them back out and undo them you know that kind of stuff so That's there are ways great. to do this that aren't necessarily about being you know like you must do it like this but uh -huh. be fun. that's great yeah because you know, that's what cooking's all about it is. Do you have any specific thoughts about how the kitchen can be an arena for failure? Because there's a, you know, I feel like the stakes tend to be a little higher when you talk about sharp knives and fire. Yeah. Well, I mean, the very first thing, we were lucky enough where we used to live that we had huge gardens. So my kids were very involved in, in growing some of the food too. And we had a lot of fruit gardens and stuff. And my son became, he was a huge fan of everything raspberry. He would try, he would strain them, he would squash them, he would, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then taking kids shopping and letting them be a part of picking ingredients for things. I have to say though, the biggest development happened when I started traveling more for work. My husband didn't know how to cook at all, really. And so we went ahead and subscribed to one of those subscription services so that we tried a couple different ones. I won't name any names, but um, it was really cool because my husband and my kids had to learn together with really simple instructions yep. and like the prep done for the most part, like here's the ingredients, you, this part, you know, and they learned how to do it that way. And now my husband is the kind of person who can open the refrigerator and see a range of ingredients and know what to do with them. And my kid is to the, my kids are to the point now, especially my younger one, um, he's got some pretty mad skills. Like he's got, he does a really, really great bechamel that's the base for a really great mac and cheese or really good queso, that kind of thing. So these are all, and he screwed up, you know, he screwed up a lot of bechamel because bechamel is pretty easy to screw up. Um, and yeah, he's started the mixer with the top not on securely and, and the blender and the chocolate stuff goes all over the walls. But it's his responsibility to clean that up. And so next time he's going to make sure that the top is on securely. Um, it's all, you know, I think, I think getting people over the hump of understanding that these things are a little risky and that's okay. And that um, they're going to feel so proud of themselves when they get it right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't need to tell you that, you know, knowing how to use a sharp knife is safer than using a dull knife any day. So, um, you know, giving them the real tools and letting them use them um, just helps them feel so competent and so good about themselves. And that look of pride, it, it's pretty irresistible. Once you've seen it a couple times, you keep chasing that high because it's really good. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what we tell our families all yeah. the time. That's great. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, you have a new book coming out. Do you want to give us a teeny little sneak sure. preview of what that is? I have a new book. Uh, in progress at the moment. If you could see around my desk, there's just piles of research. Wow. So I, um, I've been teaching um, drug and alcohol addicted kids for the past almost five years, and I'm an alcohol, I'm an uh, alcoholic in recovery myself. And so I'm raising these two kids under the specter of addiction or substance abuse disorder. And um, I, my husband and I come from a long line of, you know, addicts and alcoholics on both sides. And so for me, again, just like gift to failure, it's become really urgent for me to figure out what the evidence shows are the best ways to raise addiction resistant kids, you know, given a predisposition from a genetic standpoint, what can I do as a parent to help my kids be as responsible as possible and help them around some of the 
navigate their immature brains and, and navigate risk and take on positive risk and try to reject negative risk and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a book really just aimed at um, teachers and parents and coaches and pastors about um, preventing um, substance abuse disorder in kids. Wow, that is going to be a powerful resource. And I, I hope that it will extrapolate onto things like screen addiction, because I feel like we have more opportunities to be addicted to something in this culture than ever in history. In the meantime, there's a wonder. There are a couple wonderful books about that. There's a book by Devora Heitner called Screen Wise that I absolutely just adore. Um, and you know, there are some people out there talking about it in a really positive way. My book really focuses on chemical addiction, mm -hmm. but the the um, the brain chemistry it really is the same thing. I mean, it all comes down to dopamine and um, and in the brain. And so. Um, there will be some stuff in there about screens, but mine is really going to be focused on drugs and alcohol. Specifically. Okay, beautiful. Well, thank you so very much, Jessica. Yeah. It's been lovely. And I mean, I think it's a, it's a lot to digest. Everybody go out, get the book, The Gift of Failure, get it from the library, listen to it on audiobook. It's Jessica herself reading it. She does a great job, of course. It was so much fun. I, was, I loved narrating the audiobook. I loved it. That's so cool. That's awesome to hear. And I mean, this is you have such a passion for this teaching parents and showing us like what's the cost like what is the cost of not allowing our kids to embrace risk find out what frustration feels like get through it fail a little and come out on the other side like the cost is huge we're well, raising our kids independence well and it, you know writing books is tough and get that's what gets my butt in the chair every day is you know the risk for not letting kids fail is really high the risk for you know kids becoming addicted is really high and so how you know and plus i have the best job ever i get to be curious about something go out and learn about it and then write about it and then teach other people about it it's the best job ever that is a great job and i echo you saying that the risks are high and not teaching kids to cook and you know how to eat properly too like that parenting is it's a long game and it's a very vitally important job with lots and lots and lots of pieces and you know the parents here are exceptional they can <laughs> we can keep all the balls in the air but um you guys be sure to comment ask questions of me or of jessica and give jessica a big high five for all the work that she's done because you're really bringing an important gift and an important message to the world so thank you for being here thank you so much you bet. For everyone in the audience, come on back next week for another way to connect with an expert who has the information you need to raise healthy kids here at the Kids Cook Real Food Healthy Parenting Connector. I'm Katie Kimball, and I'm glad you were here.